Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, a big thank you to Michelle for organising this today. And hopefully you feel that it has been a great success. Uh, and a big thank you to, to Joe for inviting me here. Uh, so what I'll talk to you today is about the role of technology to uh, facilitate or improve um, uh, service delivery, health service delivery, and an example in, in, in primary care. So, um, if you think that um, sort of revolutionising, you know, the use of telephones and, and getting rid of all bashed up uh, Nokia phones uh, is a challenge, well, try and convince uh, general practices to get rid of their fax machines. I mean, <laughs> who, who uses a fax machine? <laughs> there we go. So. <clears throat> So this is the University of Birmingham where I work and this is the Institute for Mental Health. It's an interdisciplinary uh, research centre focusing on uh, research in youth mental health and well-being. Uh, having a, uh, and the importance of having a sustained impact, the research that we do in, in uh, uh, policy and, and practice. And to this end, we work very closely with a youth advisory group of young people with lived experience of mental uh, ill health uh, that help us sort of steer everything that, uh, that we do within the IMH. So the program that I lead is on uh, youth suicide prevention in children and young people. We do research around understanding the uh, processes, mechanisms and pathways that uh, underlie self-harm and suicidal behaviour and then using that intelligence to develop and evaluate evidence-based interventions both in healthcare and non-healthcare uh, settings. Uh, my particular area of expertise lies in suicide prevention in primary care, and these are just some of the organisations that we work with, both academic and non-academic and professional bodies. So we've been working with the Royal College of GPs uh, in order to um, support GPs in the assessment and management of, of suicidality in primary care. Uh, and Really, there's no better time to, to do this because the policy context in the, in the UK is so, so supportive of this. So we had a national suicide prevention strategy a few years ago, and then we had four progress reports, one very recently published, uh, all supporting the important role of primary care in, in suicide prevention within a multi-agency approach to suicide, and the important role that GPs uh, have in this role. However, uh, research that we have done at the IMH uh, and also research that other colleagues have done, not just in the UK, but I think across the world, and, and, and a prime example, the work that you're doing here in Australia, uh, has highlighted a number of challenges that GPs uh, face when it comes to assessing and managing uh, suicidality, particularly youth suicidality in, in primary care. And the, some of these challenges are around lack of specialist skills, um, lack of resources and, and uh, specialist education in youth suicide prevention. So we've done two surveys, uh, one a local survey with GPs in Nottingham, which has shown that 80% of them had not attended a mental health training in the past five years. We repeated this survey with a regional sample in, in the Midlands, so we recruited approximately 170 GPs, uh, and 50% of them had not attended any mental health training in the past five years. And yet we know that 40% of consultations in primary care have a mental health element. Um, other uh, challenges are around organisational constraints, um, sort of dysfunctional referral pathways with specialist services, particularly CAMS, um, crisis teams, um, time limited consultations. We cannot possibly uh, deal with this rising demand in a 10 minute uh, consultation. Uh, and other patient related barriers, so a lot of difficulties around communicating and understanding uh, young people in, in mental health consultations. So, and this is really, I think, 
reflect, so, so the, the, the morale in the UK or in, in primary care morale is, is quite low at the moment. So we're seeing sort of rising uh, workload, rising demand, and the pressures of this workload uh, have actually driven a lot of GPs either to early retirement or to uh, sort of leave the profession altogether, or a, a lot of reluctance in actually going into, into, into general practice. So it's quite a challenging uh, time uh, at the moment. So uh, what do GPs want? So we've done a number of, of, of studies from 2014 onwards around exploring GPs' views and experiences on assessing and managing suicidality in, in primary care and the need for continued medical education. So some of the things that they've said is around we need specialist education and, and training, but this needs to extend beyond the provision of micro skills. And actually, in both surveys that we've conducted, GPs were actually quite knowledgeable about risk factors around youth suicide. So it was how we are using that knowledge to inform our assessment and management options is, is some of the things that they really struggle with. So instead of providing GPs with more micro skills, what they said that it would be more helpful and more productive is enhancing competences and capabilities in conducting holistic, uh, sort of psychosocial needs-based assessments, uh, which is in line with clinical guidelines in, in, in the UK. And also providing them with in-house um, support with assessing and managing uh, vulnerable young people. So providing training is one aspect that we know is very difficult to evaluate educate the impact of educational interventions and also the follow-up um, sort of impact of those interventions. Um, so some of the feedback that we received from consultations that we've done with GPs is the real need for in-house uh, support, either with uh, sort of supporting their decision making and facilitating clinical uh, judgment in, in, in consultations. And actually, this is what they are expected to do. So, so the Royal College of GPs, a lot of their mental health modules uh, support the use of a structured approach to decision making, to assess and manage suicide risk, and create a safety plan. So this is what they are expected to do. What they are, <laughs> the problem is that there is no specified way of, of, of doing this. There is no specified way of well, how do we initiate those sensitive conversations with young people in primary care? How do we work with young people and their families if and where appropriate to co-produce an acceptable safety plan? And so this is where this uh, study uh, comes in, the Electronic Clinical Decision Support System that was funded by the East uh, Midlands uh, Clark, so NIHR, NHS. But before I proceed to telling you what this is about, I, I need to clarify what this is not. So this is not a risk assessment scale. This is not a, a risk prediction tool. We're not training GPs to predict risk. We know that this cannot happen. Um, there have been a number of systematic, evidence-based systematic reviews over the past five years uh, that advise against the use of suicide risk assessment skills as standalone items. The reason for this is the low uh, predictive validity. So there's a positive predictive value of 5%, which is very low. And, and we're not encouraging GPs to take that risk because you're likely to lose 95%. So uh, what this is, instead, uh, what we are developing and um, uh, piloting at the moment is a guided decision uh, making tool. So it's a, it's a health information um, technology system with decision prompts linked to assessment skills, but not used to inform the assessment, but not to replace the assessment, linked to published guidelines nationally and internationally on suicide prevention, and also with a number of educational resources and safety planning resources. So what this is, is, is a framework for guiding the consultation, for structured decision making, to reduce that variability that we see uh, among GPs on how they record and take history and, and how this informs their clinical assessment. And really, clinical decision support system is not, as an idea, is not something really innovative. It's been used in primary care for, for, for hypertension, for cardiovascular disease, uh, for diabetes, but not so much for, for, for mental health, and definitely not in, when it comes to assessing suicidal behavior. 
uh, a 2012 systematic review of clinical decision tools, both for, for, for sort of across the spectrum of physical and mental health problems, has shown that uh, they, can, they have the ability to improve decision making by aiding decision making. Uh, they facilitate the use of patient-specific information to generate assessments and then inform recommendations and ma management options. They present options to GPs for consideration, but most importantly is they engage GPs in this sort of analytical thinking. So moving away from checklists and, and sort of ticking box exercise to actually engage your brain in this assessment and engage with the young person in this assessment. So this is a study protocol that was published a few months ago at the, General, at the Journal of Medical Internet um, Research. And this is, I'll explain to you now how we went about to develop these, uh, this clinical decision support system. So it was an embedded mixed methods uh, design. Uh, phase one, we uh, carried out 30 qualitative interviews with, uh, with GPs in order to identify and explore their views around the format, the content of this tool, the questions that uh, we could ask. Uh, we also carried out four service user advisory group meetings, uh, both with uh, young people and also young adults. Uh, again, in order to inform the, the development and the design of the tool. Then at phase three, at phase two, we brought all stakeholders together in three um, participatory co-production workshops. So we had GPs, we had experts uh, in uh, suicidality, we had um, young people uh, and also other primary care attenders. And uh, what we did is that we adopted a modified um, Delphi approach, one, to identify the specific questions that we need to be having in this, uh, we need to be including in this tool. So we had a range of questions drawn from the literature and also from phase one. We asked our participants to rank them from a scale to one to seven in terms of relevance. Uh, the second day, again, we narrowed down that approach, so we use a consensus of 70% to, to uh, sort of funnel down the number of questions and the type of questions that we need to be asking. Uh, we assessed the face validity and content validity, and then at the final co-production workshop, we talked about implementation and barriers and facilitators to implementation. So how can these be implemented in clinical practice? Uh, what are the expected barriers, and how can we work with GPs and, and primary care attenders to overcome those barriers? The third phase, we've work, uh, we worked very closely with our industry partners, Primis, in order to develop the, the prototype. Uh, and then we are now in the phase four of where we're doing the usability testing with uh, three uh, primary care practices in, in the Midlands, East Midlands and West Midlands. And that includes both uh, non-live testing and live testing, and I'll talk to you about uh, the usability testing in a bit. And then feedback from this usability testing will be used to refine the, the prototype. So this is just a, a screenshot of, of what it looks like, and again, it is, it is the prototype, so it, it's, it hopefully it will look a little bit more user-friendly than this. <laughs> I just sort of bear with us. <laughs> so there are four sections, one around static risk factors, um, specific questions around suicidality that covers, uh, that are not just specific to suicidality, but adopting a more sort of holistic approach, so asking about um, school, for example, um, social life, social networks, peers, uh, and then we have um, urgency of, um, uh, of, of support needs. So again, it's not about identifying who's at low risk, who's at high risk, but it's about who urgently, urgently needs support, like right here and now, um, and uh, what, what, what does that support look like? Uh, and then creating, in collaboration with uh, um, primary care attenders, a, a safety plan and being able to share that safety plan with uh, specialist services if, if necessary. 
And also there is a link to uh, different educational resources. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that this system is fully embedded within the clinical systems that GPs use. So in the UK, we have two primary uh, systems, INIS, Web, and, and System 1. Uh, and one of the uh, feedback uh, that we received from GPs is that whatever we develop needs to be fully integrated within their existing IT systems. If it's going to take them outside uh, of, of what they're already using, they're simply not going to use it. So in terms of the usability testing, which is the phase that we are at the moment, uh, we're using an established framework for the development of the clinical decision support system by Canary et al. And really we're looking at four things. The relevance and clinical appropriateness of the tool, uh, whether it leads to an actionable decision support, uh, impact on workflow and, um, and time efficiency. So GPs were very um, adamant that this needs to fit within our sort of time-limited consultations. We cannot spend half an hour working on this tool. And we certainly do not want to be uh, looking at the screen while we have a vulnerable person next to us. And also integration with existing IT systems. The non-live uh, testing, so we, we um, have developed some standardized uh, vignettes, so case scenarios, uh, and we asked GPs to go through these case scenarios and uh, do some dummy data entry and also walk us through their thinking uh, while they're uh, entering the data. The live testing is actually using this prototype in, in real practice, uh, in, in, in routine practice. So as, I, as I said before, we have funding to uh, pilot trial this with uh, three practices in East Midlands and, and West Midlands. Uh, and we are going to be using the system usability scale to assess sort of user friendliness and relevance and all these things. GPs, uh, qualitative work to, to look at GPs' views of acceptability and feasibility, but also um, service user views around acceptability and, and feasibility. And the idea is to collect this feedback in order to refine the prototype before we move on to a feasibility study. And just as a take-home message is, is, it has been really, I mean, what I forgot to mention is that this is someone's PhD. <laughs> So someone is actually, so Matt is actually carrying the, doing this as, as, as his PhD and it has been um, very difficult, very, very difficult. Uh, and I think is, it is difficult because we are uh, dealing with uh, complex and complicated and multifaceted human behaviour. And it's very difficult to strike the balance between real world clinical complexity and finding a neat and tidy solution that is um, acceptable and feasible both by healthcare staff and also uh, by, uh, by young people and others who need it. So this, we hope that this is a pragmatic response to identified need or we adopted a bottom-up approach uh, which hopefully uh, will have implementation potential. But I think the most appealing thing with these is, is the transferability and how we can use this. And we were discussing this today with Joe uh, in, in you know, A&E departments or ED departments. We're currently working with the West Midlands Police about how this can be used in, in, uh, when vulnerable young people are bringing into custody. Um, so yes, a lot of, a lot of potential there. So finally, I would like to um, acknowledge the trooper, that is my PhD student, uh, Matthew Horrocks at the uh, University of Nottingham, uh, and the other supervisors, Professor Richard Morris and Dr. Amy Obulek. Uh, a big thank you to all the GPs who have participated in this study. It hasn't been difficult at all, uh, but the fact that they provided their advice and expertise and, and dedication is, is really a testament that there is a real need for this. Uh, and to our advisory group uh, that have sat through sort of endless hours uh, working with us and all our sponsors and other collaborators. So um, thank you very much for your time.